of an update with this. James is Jesus' younger brother, one of Jesus' younger brothers. And he knows Jesus better than anyone because no one knows you like your brother. Okay, no one knows you like family. So when James calls Jesus God, which he does in chapter 2, verse 1, it means that he knows all the potential dark secrets in Jesus' life, and he knows Jesus is God. Okay, he knows that. Any one of us, if we were to say, if we were to see on Facebook that someone were to update their status and says, Hi, I'm God, we'd be like, Yeah, no. That's not happening. I know all your dark little secrets. Satan, maybe. God, no. Not happening. Okay, but James knows, and he knows that Jesus' life is indeed that which is equal and is irrelevant of an appearance to being and is actually God in the flesh. So that's what, So he is now writing to the church. He is a pastor in Jerusalem at this point. Uh, Peter was the pastor first. James has taken over. Peter has stepped down. So now James is writing out to the people. It's one of the, it is probably the first book of the New Testament written, even before the Gospels, as far as timeline goes. So James wrote around 50 A.D., and now he is saying, hey, church, you need to get your act together. You need to figure this out. You're, you're becoming academically smart, but behaviorally you're stupid. And you've got to change this. Your actions have to match what's in your head. Okay, actions matching academia. That's the thing that he's trying to work with here. So with that in mind, let me pray for our time together, and we'll kick right into this. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, it is an honor and a privilege to be able to devote this time aside to singing praises to your name and also studying your word. And Lord, we have to learn your word. And so we're so thankful that you have tra had it translated in a language we can understand well. And we're so thankful that you have given it to us even in written form so that we can meditate on it. We can read it over and over again. And so Lord, I ask that as we do so this morning, may we leave here with more than just academics. May we leave here with more than just knowledge, but with a heart for you and your kingdom and your glory. A heart for reaching out to your creation in your name. May that change take place within us. And so I pray in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. So here's where James starts off then. In chapter 2, verse 1, he begins writing and says, My brothers. You know, it's always nice to know that he's like everyone. We're all on the same page here. We're family. Okay, so my brothers, do not show favoritism as you hold on to the faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. For example, a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and a poor man dressed in dirty clothes also comes in. If you look with favor on the man wearing the fine clothes and say, sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, just stand over there, or sit here on the floor by my footstool. Haven't you discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers, didn't God choose the poor in this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? Yet you dishonor that poor man. Don't the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Don't they blaspheme the noble name that was pronounced over you at your baptism. That's where we're going to be stopping at for today. So here's, this, this is a, an interesting topic, because this is about favoritism, okay, about showing favoritism. Of course, you know, churches today don't struggle with that. I mean that sarcastically, okay? They, they do, but you might be like, how? In what way? I've never seen that happen. So that's going to be one of the challenges of today, is trying to show how favoritism can actually take place and does take place in most churches, even this one. Okay, and how it needs to be removed and repented of and dealt with. So I can tell on your faces, you're like, really? Really? No. To which I will have a little footnote. You like my footnotes? Ah, footnote. Yes! Okay, that's what's going to be happening. Okay, is that, it, is, it is there. So here, we need to start on the same page. Favoritism. The way that is defined from the Greek word that is used simply means this. The unfair treatment of a person or group in preference to another. Isn't that a simple definition? Right? The unfair treatment of a person or group in preference to another. Almost sounds like prejudice, doesn't it? As you prefer an ethnic race or people group to another type of a deal. Okay, here James is really 
making this interesting declaration, though, that seems to give a conviction regarding class status. Okay? He doesn't talk about Jews and Gentiles here, though he does say, for example, and he uses the example of a monetary issue because that seems to be where the Jerusalem church was mostly struggling. Okay, which is interesting because later in the New Testament, a lot of them deal with Jew-Gentile issues. But that doesn't seem to be what James is noticing at this point in the church's history. That the prejudice or the favoritism that's taking place is about financial issues. And so what James is wanting is to say he wants to see real, personal, absolute change regarding this issue of favoritism. But what I have to do is, I'm going to have to try to make this, which is like, almost 2,000 years old, and make it relevant to today. So I need to set the stage on this for us, okay? I need, I need to set the stage here. So I need to ask you a question. Do you think in your mind, and just think back across your life, what is the best seat you have ever enjoyed? Okay, just think back. What event, what trip, whatever you attended, and you had the best seat you could ever, you've could ever enjoyed. Even if it wasn't the best seat possible, it was the best seat you personally have ever enjoyed. Maybe it was toward the front of the, of the bleachers, right behind home plate at a Tiger game. Maybe it was front row center at a Broadway event. Maybe it was a really great uh, stage seating over at a concert, whatever the case may be. Just think back. What is the best seat you have ever enjoyed? Now, a couple of weeks ago, Rachel and I had an opportunity that we were looking at something, some event, and we wanted good seats. Okay, we wanted the seats that maybe you're thinking about in your head right now. Really good seats, or maybe even better. Okay, because here's what was coming to town at Van Andel Arena. It was WWE! Okay, June 17th! Right, I'm like, yeah, baby, I want good seats. Okay, I want to be right up there toward the front, and I want to watch Triple H knock someone in. I want to watch Big Show. I want to be able to hear that chest slap. I want to be able to see the sweat fly off. That's what I'm wanting, okay? That's what my wife and I, we're both like, yeah. Or maybe, because here's the seating chart, maybe we could even sit right by the area here where they come marching down the aisle with that rockin' theme song and the pyrotechnics go up so much that we'll leave with a tan. That's what we're hoping for, right? Some really awesome seats right there. That's what we wanted. Now, let's go back to the webpage to buy tickets here. I want you to see something on this. I'm gonna zoom this in just a little bit here for you, just so that we can kind of see. It's kind of hard to see because of how the font is. Man, that step does not like me. But if you look down here, the best seats in the house cost $97.50 each. That's before taxes, before fees, before handling issues, before the arena costs, everything else gets added to it. Makes it, you know, $100 plus dollars quickly, okay? Plus you got Ticketmaster fees on top of that as well. And then it goes all the way down to $52.50, $37.50, all the way to the end here. And at the end, it says $17.50. Any guesses at all at where the $100 seats are and where the $20 seats are? Any guesses? I'm going to tell you. The yellow section right here by the ring, those were the $97.50 plus everything else added to it, $100, $120 tickets. They were right there in the yellow. The $20 tickets, what I could afford. Guess where they were? They were in the nosebleed, I can't see without my opera glasses section, way up here in the purple. Okay, and just to kind of give you a little idea of how small that stinking little ring is, okay, here's a shot from the marchway of the ring from June 17th here at the Van Andel Arena. You can't even see the $20 tickets because they're in the dark, way up back over here. Okay, you can't even see them. See where they're at. And that ring is so small, you could actually do the, I squish your ring with your thumb and fingers, okay? You can actually just kind of, it's the size of my, oh, I can't see the ring. Okay, that's how small it is. All right, that, that's where it's at. Now, here's what's interesting. So $100 for down here, $20 where I might as well see it on TV for free and get the best seats in the house that way. Okay, that's, that's kind of how it is. Now, here's what's interesting. 
Nobody was outside the Van Andel Arena picketing over class discrimination. Nobody was out there saying, you're unfair in your pricing. Only the wealthy can afford your good seats. You're unfair in your pricing. You cater to the rich and you take advantage of the poor because they can't afford the good seats. Why is it only the rich get the good seats? Same thing at airlines. You don't see people picketing at airlines either. Why is first class so expensive? Only the wealthy get first class. Why is it only executives get business class? Why is it that only the poor people can afford economy class, but you can't even lean your seats back right? You know, and they start, no one's picketing. No one goes to concerts and pickets there either. We just kind of deal with it, right? We just kind of deal with it. We just, uh, my wife and I, we looked at this, and we're like, okay, what seats are available? Well, there wasn't anything here. There wasn't anything in these areas. There was some purple available, and there was yellow available way off over here. And we're like, you know, yes, we'll be able to see the people come down a little bit, and yes, we'll get suntan from the pyrotechnics happening right around here at the entrance and see a lot of the cool video stuff, but $100 a ticket? That's going to cost us $200 plus just to go. We don't have that kind of money. At the same time, I don't want to pay 20 bucks for something I can't see. I'll just watch it on TV. Okay, that, that, that's just, you know, I'm going to get the app, I'm going to watch it there, I'll watch it on, on video on demand, something, I'm going to watch it differently. And I didn't go and say, man, this is unfair, why do they make the prices only for the rich to go? Why do they do it that only the pastors of bigger churches can go, and et cetera, et cetera. I didn't complain. Instead, I praise God. Thank you, Lord, for television and apps. <laughs> you know? Thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you, Lord, for friends who buy the pay-per-view and I can go to their house. Thank you, Lord, for, you know, that, right? <laughs> There's one tonight, Money in the Bank, and I'm looking forward to someone else paying for it. And I'm <laughs> going to their house. And so I'm just like, thank you, Lord, for that. But I don't pick it. I don't get mad about discrimination. Okay, so that's just kind of how that is. Now, I want you to think about what if churches did that, though? What if this church decided to say, we're going to go ahead and charge for the seats, and the best seats in the house get the highest cover charge? For example, the front row and the back row. Those would be the most expensive seats to get. And then everything in the middle would be significantly cheaper. So maybe you'd have to pay like $15 for the front row, $15 for the back row, and then like $3 for the rest of the seats. Okay? You know what? Our tithes would go way up, right? Our attendance might go way down. <laughs> what would that be like, though, if we did that? Would people say, this is ridiculous, this is unfair, how dare you do that? People would do that. Some of you, I know, would do that. You'd be like, no, why are you charging for seats? Why are you selling tickets to your church event? What's wrong with you? And if the news got a hold of that, this church charges for seat admissions for their sermons and blah, blah, blah. You know, they might end up making a big story about it. The IRS might get wind of it. Start calling it a profit organization rather than a nonprofit organization. And a whole big mess could just fall upon us if we did that. Isn't that hypocritical? Because you didn't care that concerts did it. You don't care that planes do it. You don't care that, you know, shows and theaters do it like that. You know, the Broadway plays. But we do seem to care that churches do it. And isn't that, is that hypocritical? Is that like a double standard? The answer is no. The answer is no. It's not a double standard because the church is not to behave nor appear like the world. We're supposed to be better. Okay, the church is supposed to be better than what the world is. The world says you need to have, the, if you want the best seats, you need to pay extra money. The church says we're all equal. First come, first serve, sit where you'd like, and it's free. I would love for a day that WWE says, yeah, free seating. <laughs> I'm sure they do. It's called the sidewalk. <laughs> you know? uh, but it's, but we're, the church is not supposed to look like the world. We're supposed to look better. We're supposed to act better with different priorities and different values, and we're supposed to treat everybody equally. Now, across this state and across this country, churches all over the place, every single one of them that I know of, have free seating for people to come, and everyone's equal upon their seating. Okay, I don't know of any churches. I don't know of a single one that charges admission. I know the laws may say that's what tithes are, but tithes are still optional. 
Not from God's point of view, but from how we treat it, it's, it's optional, right? And so it's not like it's an admission fee. And so churches across the country, indeed, have impartial seating in that regard. The only one that might be favored a little bit might be those in wheelchairs, because they get the special little ramp area, and, but they've also been very careful. It's either in the middle, also a section in the front, and a section in the back, so they're catered to depending on how they want and where they want to sit. Even that has a lot of equality to it. So does that mean churches don't deal with equality? Does that mean churches everywhere treat everybody equally? Does that mean we got it fixed? The answer to that is no. Just because we don't have the seating problems like what James was dealing with at the church in Jerusalem does not mean that we have fixed the problem. The problem still resides in the hearts of the people, and it expresses itself in different ways. And that's what I'm going to try to do my best to point out. First, I want to deal with James's example as how James makes it look like and what he is looking at here. So he starts off there in verse 2, and he talks about a man who comes in to the meeting, comes in to church, and he is wearing a fancy ring. That's really the description, and, and fine clothes. Okay, that's the description James gives. Nothing really extremely detailed, just fine clothes and a gold ring. What that would look like for us today would be that maybe a guy comes in, he's in an Armani suit, or a girl comes in, she's in a Valentino dress, and they have really shiny shoes, their aftershave or perfume is just astounding, and they're, they got maybe a nice watch and fancy rings, they're clean cut, everything is just oh, professional, almost Hollywood-esque. Okay? So that person walks into the room. And here's another way that that begins to express itself, really, in our churches of today. Because so many people, even people who are poor, dress nice for church. They find something that works, and it's hard to distinguish. So we tend to do it by jobs. You know, oh, you're, you're a surgeon. Oh, oh, you're a partner at a big law firm. Or, oh, I see, you're a, and we hear their job. And we automatically equate that with business success, high income. We're glad you're here. We hope you tithe. Okay, that, that's really kind of the thing. And we want to cater to them to the best of our ability because we don't want to turn them off to services lest they leave and don't tithe. So we would love for them to be a committed tithing family here because that would really fix our budget. Okay, so that, that, that's one way that that begins to look. And then James says a poor person walks in and the uh, poor person is dressed differently. They're not necessarily in Armani suits or Valentino dresses. Maybe they're wearing jeans and a t-shirt. Uh, maybe they got shoes that are well-worn, and they uh, are, are coming in, and we find out their job is at Family Fair or some retail. And so we know that, okay, you're not making buku bucks, not compared to the lawyer that just came in. Okay, the guy from Barnum, he's making 100000 a year, but your Family Fair, you're doing what? Maybe $8, $9 an hour? And, and so you're, you're really not on the same level. Okay, so that's automatically that distinction that James starts with. Then he offers to go from that to the treatment. If you say to the wealthy and you say to the poor, okay, it says to the wealthy, uh, sit over here and have a good place. Hi, welcome, we're so glad you're here. Uh, but we're really good. And, you know, and we're like, yes, come on over here and, and here's a good spot for you. We calibrate our sound here. Okay, <laughs> so you want to sit here. And everything is going to be available for you here. And then the poor guy comes in, and maybe he's even ignored. And what James says is that you tell him to stand over there. In other words, out of the way, where we can't see you, you're not blocking our view, and we can't smell you. Okay, so the poor person is brought someplace else. And James also uses the phrase, sit here on the floor by my footstool. Which means, I am going to look upon you with condemnation judgment. Because anyone that is put on or beside or under the footstool of the Lord are where the enemies go. Because they are under his judgment. So when James uses this phrase for the people in the church, it's in other words we say, Oh look, a wealthy person. Well, I look up to you. I have automatically, by default, a good thoughts about you. And then a poor person comes in, and you're automatically now under my judgment. You're automatically, my default position is, Well, why don't you go and get a real job? I bet you dropped out of college. I bet you made some bad mistakes. I bet you have some habits and some addictions that's sucking up all your money, especially if they're homeless. We automatically default with something's wrong with you. That's our default point of view. 
Okay, now, by even talking about this, we might start thinking, uh, okay, I, I, maybe now it's getting a little bit tight. Especially if we start driving downtown and we see people in suits and people sitting on the street with holes in their jeans and no shoes. And we say, okay, the guy in the suit's got a job. The other guy's lazy and is a bum. Okay, automatically, we got positive, negative connotations of favoritism right from the default start. Okay, that's kind of right where we're at. And so here's how this can, can really be also express itself. When we see somebody and they drive up and the doctor drives up in a Bentley. Right? And we look at that and we go, ooh, a Bentley, convertible, nice. You know? And then the uh, poor guy pulls up and he has a rusty Chevrolet. You know what I'm talking about, right? Rust and smoke, my heaters broke, the door just blew away, <laughs> light a match and see the dash, and then I start to pray. Frame is bent, the muffler went, radio, it's okay. Oh, what fun it is to ride this rusty Chevrolet. Right? You know what I'm talking about, right? And so we see them pull up, and we tell everybody in advance, someone pulled up in an entourage. Oh, my gosh. Or, uh-oh, we just got our whole parking lot filled with blue smoke. <laughs> okay, we're going to have to keep this in mind. Right? And we start with that type of default point of view. Now, here's the problem, is that so many people don't think that that type of view is happening in the church today. Because they want to deceive themselves. Paul, uh, James talked last week about how people self-deceive. Okay, how they want to deceive themselves and say they don't struggle, they don't fall, or if they have problems, they admit they have problems, but they don't make any differences, any changes in their life. So they just accept that they have problems and move on, because after all, who's perfect? I can justify it with, we're all dirty, so why try to clean up? Okay, why, they, why, why try to do anything different? And so people can deceive themselves and thinking they don't do favoritism. So I have to come up, I had to really stop and think. And I'm praying, and I'm like, okay, how can I think of a good example of how this looks in the church of today? Because I know that even with our group, if people walk in, we're just excited that somebody walked in. Okay, we don't care if they got a suit or a t-shirt, we're just happy another seat is filled. Okay, so we tend to be very equal in that regard. We're like, a person! Yay! And we act like a love-struck cougar, regardless of who they are. Okay, so... Uh, it tends to express itself in different ways in a lot of churches, and it looks something like this. The people with the wealth, the people with the highest income of the church, hold the positions of leadership. The people with the lowest incomes do not. Isn't that interesting? All across the churches, you can look, you can see, all the people, if they're in the poor person on a committee, they're not the chair. They're just kind of like that servant person, okay? And they're looked down upon. They aren't given the chair position. They're not put on leadership position. They tend to be people who have really good income. In fact, if somebody comes into the church that's wealthy, someone comes into the church that's poor, and there's a position that's available for service, who usually will end up with that job if they both want it? Odds are the wealthy person. The person with the better job gets that position of leadership. That tends to be what happens. If a wealthy person comes in, and even if they're not in competition for a job with a poor person, they are made a position for them so that they don't leave, so that they have a position of leadership. And what's not asked is, is it possible that that wealthy person is not spiritually mature enough to handle a leadership position? And if that's the case, they're not told that. They're just given a position anyways, because we want to make them happy. Because we don't want their tithe to go because they have high income. Okay, but we don't tell them, well, you're not really, you need to be more spiritually mature. But somehow, if they have a good job, we equate that with they're intelligent, they're competent, and they're spiritually mature because they've been blessed with such a good job. But have you ever worked for somebody that made more money than you that was less intelligent than you? Some of us, I'm sure, have worked in jobs like that. Okay? Um, at the bus station, I don't say that because my mom is my employer. <laughs> but it's but that's what happens, though. Or if someone is a really good teacher in a school or a professor at a college, automatically what people default to is they need to be a Sunday school teacher. They never stop to ask or to consider that just because someone's a good teacher does not mean they're a good teacher of the word. Just because they're knowledgeable for a topic they teach at a college does not mean they understand the Bible with any type of theological depth to be a teacher there. 
And it could be that someone who's a good teacher is not a good teacher of the Bible. And we need to get somebody who's not a teacher to teach the Bible because they're better at teaching the Word. The two are very different. Okay, teaching the Word of God is different than being just a teacher of English or of psychology or whatever. Okay, you need to be a good teacher of the Word. And there are some people that have good jobs. They're a professor. They make good money. And they lack spiritual depth. And they might be a baby Christian. And it's just too early for them to be put into that type of a position at this point in time. They need to go around the block a few times before they get put in any type of a leadership position, unless they become conceited, as Paul has said in several of his letters. Okay, so it, it's, those are things that tend not to be brought to the surface. That's where favoritism tends to lie. One more example, just for fun, just for gathered here together. I don't have my watch, so we got time. <laughs> okay, one more quick example. Let's say that you're at a, uh, you're walking down like by a store, and you see a guy, and he has a really nice suit, good haircut, and what looks to be a homeless person, and an argument. Who tends to be sided with? The wealthy person. On average, whenever I see, even at the bus station, a, a homeless person start youting out, shouting out, this, you took my money, and the guy in the suit says, I did not, it was my money, you're just trying to get it from me. People are going to tend to side with the guy with the suit. I have watched it happen day in, day out, multiple times, even by security. I have watched them favor the nicer dressed people to the lower dressed people. Okay, that's just what happens. Now, could it be that the homeless person is telling the truth and the rich person took money from them? Is that possible? Yeah, it's possible. But we start thinking to ourselves, why would they? They got enough. That's how they got it. <laughs> you never know. It's just one of those things that we tend to want to defend the rich person and put fault upon the poor person right from the get-go. That's what we tend to do. Or we tend to favor women over men, especially if the woman is crying. And we don't tend to realize that not every crying woman is the victim. Sometimes women use tears as a form of manipulation. And you get away with junk. And that happens. I've seen that a dozen times. Okay, so we tend to have favoritism that is all over the place within our churches and across society. As much as we want to say we don't, we do. And we'll certainly do. It is there. It's in our hearts. It's that default thought that comes in our minds. It's, it's there. It is very much pre uh, present. And here's the funny thing. Here's the kicker. When James talks about a poor person, he is not referring to a person who is poor because of addictions, because of sin, because of whatever. <laughs> that is not the poor person he's talking about, because the poor person in the passage that, he, that we read, that poor person also has an inheritance of what? God's kingdom. Which means they're not the unrighteous, ungodly poor. These are the righteous, godly poor that James is referring to in this passage. These are the people who have been, at, they, they had something, they got, maybe they got taken advantage of by somebody who is wealthy, maybe they got laid off in order to give higher bonuses to the executive. And because they got laid off, they couldn't make their mortgage payments, so the house got repossessed. Now they're homeless, trying to figure out how to get their life reinvented. <coughs> and then we look upon and that's, and we look upon them, and we say, man, you deserve what you got, you're the one that falls, and we look down upon them, and James is like, do you not realize that there are the difference between the godly wealthy and the ungodly wealthy and the godly poor and the ungodly poor. The goal is not about wealthy or poor. The goal is about godliness. The goal is about righteousness. And the goal is about bringing people who don't have righteousness, their righteousness is like filthy rags, and bring them to Jesus so Jesus can say, here, wear my clothes and be righteous because of me. And watch Jesus put his cleanliness upon them, and then they're the godly poor. And they can start working toward that maturity. That's James's focus here. Okay, that's what he's uh, talking about. And so when he says, hey, this poor person, he's talking about people that are considered poor by the world's estimation, but not poor by God's estimation. Okay, they have an inheritance of extreme wealth. They just haven't got it yet. It's called the kingdom of God, and it's a coming. Okay, so that's what James is also referring to here in this passage. And here's where we can also end up pendulum swinging the wrong direction. 
If we've been having this idea and realize, man, I have been favoring the wealthy. You're right. I do. I am guilty of some of those thoughts and some of those defaults and some of those positions and biases. You're right. I need to start focusing on the poor people. <laughs> no, no. That's the sin of the other side of the same coin. Because now you're showing favoritism the other direction. The goal is you don't put any above each other, but that they're both viewed the same. So don't focus on the rich. Don't focus on the poor. You focus on people. Regardless of their status, regardless of their class, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And here's where James puts his, um, and that's an easy mistake that we can make. But here's where James puts the basis for equality on. This is the fascinating part. James's basis for equality is in chapter two, verse one. It is what the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, that's the basis for equality. You have no business doing favoritism if you claim to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, Here, here's just a truth. I'm going to say it, and you're going to maybe want to give pushback. If not you, the people online later are going to send me emails. So it's just going to be fun. So I need to remind myself to change my email to our head deacon uh, for the next week. So if anyone wants to complain, it goes to him. <laughs> so that's just, uh, here's the truth. Christianity is the only religion in the world with a true basis for equality. Everybody else are hypocrites. Everybody else are hypocrites when they scream equality and discrimination issues. They're all going against their point of view when they claim it because they have no basis for it. Let me explain how this works. Okay? If you're going to say that there is no God and you believe in evolution or that God used evolution, or whatever heresy along those lines you want to use, you say evolution, evolution is about survival of the fittest. Okay. Therefore, you are not supposed to care about the distinctions of the wealthy and poor, because they deserve to be left behind, because it is survival of the fittest. There is no room for equality in that point of view. Okay. It is treated like a herd of animals. If one is wounded or weak or sick, do the other animals circle around it to defend it, or do they let it be eaten by the lions and the jaguars? Okay, they let it be eaten. And that's the way the evolution is, and that's its focus. So if someone's going to believe evolution and then scream, that's discrimination, hypocrite. Based on what? What ground do you have for that? You can't claim morality, you can't claim anything else if you're going to go with survival of the fittest evolution. Or let's say we go with Buddhism and, and, and uh, Hinduism, with the belief of karma and whatnot. Okay, Karma is this thing that you live, and then when you die, you get reincarnated either at a higher state or a lower state based upon your scorecard of karma. Okay, So if you had low karma, you get reincarnated either as a poor person or a lower life form. And if you're a poor person, you have to endure life as a poor person in order to reset the scorecard to have the karma to have a higher lifestyle in your next life. And if you help somebody relieve the pain and suffering of that whoredom, they don't get to reset that scorecard and get reincarnated at the same lifestyle the next life around. So therefore, you're supposed to kind of do a little bit of charity, but very minimal. Enough charity to be able to say that, you know, I'm going to give you a dime or two, but that's as far as I'm going to go, because I want to add a karma point for me. But I don't want to take away karma points from preventing you from being purified of your bad karma. So therefore, Buddhism and Hinduism do not, that's why, that's why India and all those other countries have strong class distinctions, and they don't want to get rid of it. Because the lower class people have to suffer to purify their karma so they can get reincarnated at a better life form. So in the end, by not helping them, you're helping them, they say them to themselves. And they get rid of their guilty conscience that God put in everyone to treat everyone equally. But they have no basis on the religion. And on and on the religions go. There is no basis for equality outside of the God of the Bible. It doesn't exist. Okay, It's all hypocrisy. So it's fascinating to me watching the news and watching the world scream, discrimination, discrimination, but we don't believe in God, the God of the Bible. And it's just hypocrisy in the truest form everywhere. Everywhere. Now churches that do treat people with favoritism are also doing hypocrisy because they are not living a life that is consistent with the values, goals, and viewpoints of God. They're not reflecting their creator. So the churches that do favoritism, also hypocrites, absolutely so. But Christianity as a whole is the religion with the basis on equality. That's why when America was founded, that the first uh, 
100 colleges, first 100 colleges planted in this country were Christian colleges. In fact, even before the uh, 1776, of the first nine, eight of them were Puritan-based. One of them was even a Baptist-based, uh, planted about uh, 60 years before 1776. So the early 1700s, there was a Baptist college that was planted. And so for the first 100 years of our country, actually, for the first 100 years, I give a, a couple extra years as well, 100-something, okay, there was no public, non-religious college in this country. It didn't exist. Okay, because Christianity was like, we want people to read the Bible for themselves. That means they have to be educated to learn how to read. And so we're going to set up institutions to help everyone be able to read. And they set it up all across. That's what our country was founded on. In fact, when we had the whole slavery revolution, even recently with the whole Rosa Parks thing, who were the loudest presenters and speakers against slavery? Pastors and Bible believers on the God of the Bible. Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King Jr., for example, were very much, they, they believed in Jesus and the God of the Bible, and they shouted equality based upon being made in the image of God. Okay, so all the re reforms and movements like that, all about equality, that really became a revolution that stuck and held. Ones that were based on consistency and truth and fact appropriately, without hypocrisy, was all Christian. It was all based on God, the uh, God of our Bible. The God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. That is the basis for equality. This is why James makes a statement in chapter 2, verse 1, that if you show favoritism, you do not have faith in God. That's basically what he is saying in that. He says, how can you have favoritism and say you have faith in God? Because to have faith in God literally means to say that uh, I am going to have my values, my goals, and my desires reflect God, and my behaviors will reflect that, and my behaviors will be about maintaining a relationship with God. That's what it means to have faith in God. That's how James uses that. And if you're going to show favoritism, if you're going to be that way, then you're not having faith in God, because that is not how God rolls. That's not how God does that. In fact, all throughout Scripture, we have this position. Romans 2.11, God shows no favoritism. Job 34.19, God shows no partiality to princes and does not favor the rich over the poor, for they are all the work of his hands. Leviticus 19.15, do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great. In other words, don't even put the poor over the great. Just keep them equal, equality there, as well as James 2.1 that we've already talked about. Because here's what favoritism is all about. If you want to put favoritism and prejudice and all that into one category, it's all about one word, glory. Favoritism is all about glory. Okay, We want to be up front. We want to be special. We want to be on top. We want to be number one. Yeah, I've never seen a basketball team saying, Woohoo, we're hoping for number three. You know, never have I seen the Tigers go, oh, we're hoping to come in second place this year. You know, now the Lions might say that. But, but you know, <laughs> normally teams are all like, we want to be number one. Okay, that's what, we, that's what they're after. That's what they're rooting for. They want to be on top. They want to show forth their glory. That's what it's about. In fact, Maslow's hi hierarchy of needs has at the top of his needs pyramid, the most important one is self-transcendence and self-actualization. Where I can show forth my glory. And that's the number one need. And a human has to be able to show forth their glory. On and on it goes. And we will do favoritism because either that person reflects us, reflects what we stand for, or they have connections that will get us more toward presenting our glory. Somehow it will benefit us. And so favoritism comes into play. We want the rich person to come in and tithe so we can have more money, so we can be a bigger, better church and show forth our glory. We want to be able to have that, to have that connection and that influence so that they can pull strings on our behalf so we can move up our ladder and show forth our glory. We want to be all about those that reflect us because that means as they're glorified, so are we with them. It is all about glory. And who is truly the one deserving transcendence? 
Who is truly the one deserving actualization? Who is the one that really is to be the only, who is the only one worthy to show forth his glory? Who is the one that of all the kingdoms is the ultimate king? That would be King Jesus. Okay, that's who's on top. When Maslow says, hey, you have to have self-actualization and self-transcendence, that's the biggest need. No, it is coming to terms with God's transcendence and God's actualization. That's our biggest need. That needs to be at the top of the pyramid. Maslow has the whole thing turning into ourselves, and we need to turn it toward God, not into ourselves. So he's got his whole need-based scale completely wrong. The whole pyramid's screwed up. It's all about selfishness and favoritism. It is not about the kingdom of God. So when we are about, we need to be about God's glory. And when we are about God's glory, when we are about his kingdom instead of our kingdom, then we will find that we have no place for partiality. We have no place for favoritism. Because we recognize that we are just as messed up as everyone else. Even if they make more, even if they make less, we're just as messed up as they are. When I see a homeless person at the bus station, I tell you, the bus station has been one of the best jobs for me and one of the hardest jobs for me. It, it has been because I am surrounded by people more poor than me. I am surrounded by people who are homeless, and I have to look upon them, and I have to see them as equal with me. And sometimes I struggle with that. Let me just bear that out to you. Sometimes I struggle with that. I want to look upon them and say, you've made a whole bunch of mistakes. You've made I want to put judgment on them. But I don't know what their condition is. I don't know what the situation is. Some of them are mentally ill, and they can't get a job because they just mentally can't do it. And I have to reach out with love and compassion to them. I have to recognize that they need Jesus as much as I and neither one of us are better than the other, regardless of income, regardless of living arrangements, regardless of anything. So I'd love to just challenge each of you. When you get a little bit of time off, and I know a lot of you are pressed on your time, I want to just encourage you, come to the bus station and sit down in a bench for an hour and watch people. Just sit there for one hour and watch people. Just see them. Just sit there and see them. See what they're talking about. Eavesdrop a little bit. You know, to hear their conversation, see the behavior, see what their lives are like, and then say to yourself and recognize they need Jesus as much as you. It will be a humbling experience. Because I get that every week, because I've been down there multiple days every week for over eight years. And it's still sometimes a struggle for me. Still sometimes a struggle because I do run across the ungodly, unrighteous poor. I do run across people that they need Jesus just as much as I need Jesus. And they are choosing a life of crime, a life of addiction, and it is hard to see them destroy and sabotage their life. And I so much want to say, stop that. I so want to say that. I so want to just go up and go, smack, smack, what are you doing? You're destroying your life. And to try to do that with compassion, is hard. Jesus did it. His disciples struggled with it. Jesus did it. His disciples struggled with it. So recognize the struggle in yourself. But go there. See the people. See who Jesus has died for. He died for you, and he also died for them. And we're all equal because we're all made in the image of God. We all wear his name. We all have his reflection upon us. Regardless of the color, regardless of the status, the status, regardless of the income, regardless of the clothes, and regardless of the odor and hygiene issues, we are all in the image of God. Will you go? to where the broken and the hurting are and see them face to face and just maybe, just maybe, extend out that hand of prayer and compassion and welcome and friendship to them. Because we all need it. We all need Jesus. We all have 
that need for that? Will you do that one simple assignment this week? To go to the bus station for an hour. That's it. And see people. Some of them at the darkest points in their lives are there. They'll be sitting on the floor, tears rolling down their face, and they have hit rock bottom with nowhere to go. If anywhere we can know that there's a place where a person, that it can be the hands and feet of Jesus, it is that place. That we can go and sit down next to them and pray with them. Talk with them. Love on them. That's the place. There's other places across the city. I'm not going to go to all the places. You can go to Mel Trotter. You can go to the Shepherds of Independence. You can go to Degage. You can. There's lots of places. I'm just telling you, just go to the bus station just for an hour. Go somewhere and see people. And see what it takes to be the church there. Not in the safety of these four walls. The church there. Have a word of prayer.